Dreamscape presents Dear Fahrenheit 451, Love and Heartbreak in the Stacks by Annie Spence. Narrated by Stephanie Spicer. I absolutely demand of you and everyone I know that they be widely read in every damn field there is, in every religion and every art form, and don't tell me you haven't got time. There's plenty of time. You need all of these cross-references. You never know when your head is going to use this fuel, this food, for its purposes. Ray Bradbury Introduction Dear Reader, Welcome to Dear Fahrenheit 451. Shall we begin? Wait, I know you guys. Do you remember me? I'm your public librarian. I walked you over to the Murakami that time. I helped you get the DVD about exploring New Zealand, and you came back and told me about how wonderful your trip was, and we both got tears in our eyes. Remember when you said you paid my salary and mumbled, bitch, under your breath when I wouldn't do your kid's research paper for them? I'm that bitch. I know all of you, because librarians love getting to know their communities. From Junie B. Jones' kid to Conspiracy Theory Andy. If I hold up my magic mirror, romper room style, I can see each and every one of you reading this right now. I see Jeff, who always says he's picking up his Regency romances for his sister. No judgment, Jeff. And I see Donna, who reads philosophical horror novels as fast as I can supply them. I see Carol, whose grandson bought her a tablet and then apparently went into the witness protection program before he could help her figure out how to use it. In fact, I see all the doting millennials who pat themselves on the back for giving expensive devices to their elderly relatives and then go back to college without explaining how to download an ebook. But as close as my connection is to all of you, your literary preferences and internet habits, There's a population I know even more intimately. The stacks. Librarians aren't just reading while we're sitting at the reference desk. We curate the collection by providing a fine balance of items patrons need to be well-rounded, poetry, consumer reports, and items they request that we buy. More seniors yoga on VHS. We also decide when a book is no longer needed and has to be released. Two points if you got that The Giver reference. Professionally, we call this process weeding the collection. Personally, I call it book breakups. I know books on a deep level, so deep that over the years I've found myself talking to the books. Only in my head, because I'm not crazy, but inside my head, I talk to them in letter form, because books are fancy and need to be formally addressed. It used to be just at the library, while I was weeding or when I would come across an old friend, I mean, book. But now I seem to do it every time I look at a bookshelf, at my mom's, at a dinner party, at the bar, or on date night. Basically, if you've spoken to me in the presence of a bookshelf in the past decade, I wasn't paying attention. And why shouldn't I talk to books? I've got a lot to say to them. Reading has shaped me guided me, reflected me, and helped me understand and connect with, and this is not hyperbole, humanity. If you picked up this book, it's because somewhere in the past, and more in the future, if I have anything to do with it, a book has changed your life. Well, mine too, dear reader, mine too. I grew up in a small, rural Michigan town. I was the youngest of a big family living in a tiny house that was overflowing with people, stray dogs, love, and saltine crackers. We didn't have a lot back then, but we did have the library, and its books showed me a bigger world. I know that sounds confusing because you're like, wait, bigger world? Aren't you just still hanging out at the library? Did you ever even leave? I only mean that books have shown me some amazing things. They've thrilled me and soothed me. They've told me when it was time to give up on them. They've helped me not give up on myself. Reader, for all of the silliness and good goddamn fun involved in writing a book that talks to books, 
I know you'll believe me when I say that these books have talked right back to me. And if this book you're holding could talk, it would say that it wants you to connect to it, to laugh with it, and to walk away with a whole new list of other books that you can't wait to get involved with. Happy reading. Your ever-loving librarian, Annie. Dear librarians, please don't weed me. Love, Annie. 1. Books, The Letters Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. This is the ideal life. Mark Twain Rule number one. Don't fuck with librarians. Neil Gaiman, Gaiman's Online Journal, 2004 Fiction, Tart, Donna, Growing Apart Dear the Goldfinch, we've grown apart, or I guess you've grown apart, like physically. Your spine is torn to crap. The hardest part about this, I'm the one who did it to you. I love you so much, Goldfinch, your language, your emotion, your suspense. Needless to say, the author picture on your back cover is the main reason I started parting my hair down the middle. So I recommended you to everyone. I broke the librarian's reader's advisory code, which is to base your reading suggestions for a patron on their previous preferences, not my own. I broke it for you, Finchie. I recommended you to folks checking out Sylvia Brown, Dead People Talking Books, and patrons asking where the Amish fiction was shelved, and people who told me the last book they enjoyed was Hatchet by Gary Paulson which is, sadly, every third adult male who comes into the library. I'm not saying you won the Pulitzer because of me, but you may want to think about adding one more name in the acknowledgments when the next edition comes out. You feel me? Unfortunately, your hard exterior couldn't protect you from the reality of the world outside these shelves. It was bound to happen— you're nearly 800 pages, and about a gazillion people cracked you open. Eventually, you cracked too. It's my fault. I shouldn't have sent you home with people who are used to reading mass market paperbacks. That's something I have to live with. I know you are a book that only feels fulfilled when being read and admired. You'd be too ashamed to sit next to your other copies as busted up as you are, and there's nothing book glue can do for you now. You don't smell or anything, if that's a consolation. I'm taking you home with me. You'll sit right next to your old pal, The Little Friend, on a browser-friendly shelf above the record player where my friends will look at you with great reverence before declining to borrow you because they are too busy to read. I know, they're fools. I'm the only one who truly knows you well enough to notice how fragile you are on the inside. No one but you and I will ever see the duct tape holding you together or the discard stamp on your title page. I promise you that. Seriously, forever yours, Annie. Fiction. Tolstoy, Leo. Classic Russian Literature. The Bachelor. Choices. Dear Anna Karenina, I feel like I don't even know you. Maybe that's why I find it so difficult to say, I've been seeing someone else. Jeez, I'm sorry. I know I've led you on. I asked my friends about you. I checked you out more than once. You came home with me. You stayed for a month. But while you were on my coffee table looking so earnest and so very long, Eleanor and Park by Rainbow Rowell was in my bed. And then some Megan Abbott mysteries and then Dolly Parton's autobiography. Twice. I tried. I really did. Once, I even picked you up and held you. I kept you on my lap while I watched The Bachelor. And you made me feel better, like I wasn't just some faceless citizen of Bachelor Nation. I read Russian literature, I thought to myself. I'm just smugly observing this show until the next commercial, when I will begin my scholarly analysis. But then I kept watching through after the final rose. 
Anna, I don't have one unkind word to say about you because I haven't read you. Perhaps it's just not our time. There will come a day, probably, when I get a hankering for a bleak 864-page novel translated from Russian. But until that day, back to the shelves you go. I tried to look up goodbye in Russian, but it's really hard to spell, so just goodbye, Annie. Fiction. Eugenides, Jeffrey. Creepy Stories. Creepy Love for Creepy Stories. Dear the Virgin Suicides, congratulations on your 15th consecutive year as my favorite book. To mark this commemorative anniversary, I'm writing you a love letter. It'll be moony, goony nonsense compared to your perfection, but the thing you're perfect about is conveying imperfect love. So even though this is going to look a little bit like pen puke, I hope you'll appreciate its sincerity. Here goes. I love that you have no plot and an electric story at the same time. The five Lisbon sisters commit suicide in the suburbs of Detroit. Their neighbor boys loved them and couldn't understand them. We know that in your first few pages. Nothing else happens except everything except tiny, beautiful moments of arms barely touching and records playing over the phone and sad math teachers and goal-line chalk striping a beautiful girl's back. All of the minutia that composes lives and somehow adds up to death. I love every one of your fucking golden sentences. They are slam you shut and clutch you against my chest, sublime. The description of the adornments that spill around the teenage girls and the entire swooning Trip Fontaine passage. Oh, man. I wanted him to save Lux Lisbon so bad. Then, that last paragraph made me want to collapse on a fainting couch and linger for the rest of the day with your delicate memory. I love that after I read you every time, My own everyday movements and the quotidian moments of my life feel more beautiful. That's the mark of a lovely book. You make me want to never look at my phone again, to abandon Facebook in favor of old astronomy books and nature guides. I just want to brush my hair languidly in front of the mirror, sift through old costume jewelry, hold hands, and listen to way more bread. It's more than that, though. I feel like you get me. Like, get me. I don't feel like you were written for me. I feel like you were written from inside of my psyche. The hazy gaze with which you look back on suburban Detroit is the same lens I was spying through growing up. My folks, having moved from Detroit to rural mid-Michigan before I was born, Those cities and the people left behind were a dreamy, mysterious world that existed in the before time of my parents' lives. I was enamored with and naive of downstate, as we called it, in the same way your narrators were always reaching for and never quite grasping the Lisbon sisters. The fuzzy aura that Tripp saw surrounding Lux echoed the one I saw glowing around my older cousin Melanie when she came to visit from Detroit. The music the boys play for the girls after Miss Lisbon makes Lux burn her records was the music my dad put on our record player. And when he listened, he got a far-off look in his eyes. When I left for college a whopping 45 minutes away from home, I found myself drawn to the city girls in my dorm hall. Girls who called their purses bags and had gone to foreign countries for senior trip. Who had been to concerts that did not take place at the fairgrounds. Who owned hair straighteners and manicure kits. Who took for granted all the music and art and stories that grew from the same place they were from. These girls often felt compelled to give me life advice as they smoked next to their open windows. Because they could tell I admired them and because they found the podunk homecoming queen vibe I gave off endearing. Absolutely all of it was terrible advice. But I don't mind, 
Because eventually, one of those smoky window conversations where I let them pretend to be Carrie from Sex and the City...